Well, good evening, everyone. I'm apologies. I started it at uh, 21.29 and for some reason it didn't come up, so I had to stop and start it again. Um, but I'm glad uh, that we're able to broadcast now. Um, so welcome to Tuesday evening prayers on this, the 18th of May. And today we say happy birthday to our moderator, Geoffrey Clark, who is 60 today. And we pray and hope that he's had a fantastic day celebrating his birthday. And we pray that God will give him many more to celebrate too. So our open praise. O oh God, make speed to save us. O oh God, make haste to help us. Your word is a lantern to my feet and a light upon my path. Your decrees are my inheritance forever. Truly, they are the joy to my heart. How sweet are your words to my taste. They are sweeter than honey to my mouth. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was and in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. Alleluia. And uh, tonight's psalm, Tuesday evening psalm, is Psalm 121, which I've chosen to read tonight from the International Children's Version. I look up to the hills, but where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. He made heaven and earth. He will not let you be defeated. He who guards you never sleeps. He who guards Israel never rests or sleeps. The Lord guards you. The Lord protects you as a shade protects you from the sun. The sun cannot hurt you during the day, nor the moon cannot hurt you by night. The Lord will guard you from all dangers. He will guard your life. The Lord will guard you as you come and you go, both now and forever. Amen. And our Old Testament reading comes from Ezekiel chapter 7. Um, and we're reading from verses 10 to 15, and then it jumps to verse 23 to 27. The day of judgment has come, the morning dawns, for your wickedness and pride have run their course and reached their climax. None of these rich and wicked men of pride shall live. All your boasting will die away, and no one will be left to bewail your fate. Yes, the time has come and the day draws near. There will be nothing to buy or sell for the wrath of God is on the land. And even if the merchant lives, his business will be gone for God has spoken against all the people of Israel. All will be destroyed. Not one of those whose lives are filled with sin will recover. The trumpets shout for the Israel's army, mobilise, but no one listens, for my wrath is on them all. If you go outside the walls, there stands the enemy to kill you. If you stay inside, famine and disease will devour you. Prepare chains for my people, for the land is full of bloody crimes. Jerusalem is filled with violence, so I will enslave her people. I will crush your pride by bringing to Jerusalem the worst of nations to occupy your homes, break down your fortifications you are so proud of and defile your temple. For the time has come for the cutting off of Israel. You will sue for peace, but you won't get it. Calamity upon calamity will befall you. Woe upon woe, disaster upon disaster. You will long for a prophet to guide you, but the priests and the elders and the kings and the priests, princes will stand helpless, weeping in despair. The people will tremble with fear, for I will do to them the evil they have done and give all of them their just deserts. They shall learn that I am the Lord. Well, may God add his understanding to our reading this evening. Amen. So our um, hymn that I've chosen this morning is a chorus. It's uh, a new commandment I give unto you. And this was recorded at, at my manse in um, 2020 as part of our morning worship. A new commandment I give unto you.
And our gospel reading comes from Luke chapter 10, reading from verses 1 to 17. The Lord chose 70 other disciples and sent them on ahead in pairs to all the towns and villages he planned to visit later. These were his instructions to them. Plead with the Lord for the harvest to send out more labourers to help you, for the harvest is so plentiful and the workers so few. Go now and remember that I am sending you out as lambs among the wolves. Don't take any money with you or a beggar's bag or even an extra pair of shoes and don't waste time along the way. Whenever you enter into a home, give it your blessing. If it's worthy of blessing, then the blessing will stand. If not, the blessing will return to you. And when you enter the village, don't shift around from home to home, but stay in one place, eating and drinking without question whatever is set before you. And don't hesitate to accept hospitality, for the workman is worthy of his wage. If a town welcomes you, follow these two rules. Eat whatever is set before you, heal the sick, and as you heal them, say, the kingdom of God is very near. But if a town refuses, go out into its streets and say, we wipe the dust of your town from our feet as a public announcement of your doom. Never forget how close you were to the kingdom of God. Even Sodom will be better off than such a city on, the day, on judgment day. What horrors await you, you cities of Khorasan and Bethsaida? For if the miracles I did for you had been done in the cities of Tyre and Sidon, their people would have sat in deep repentance long ago, clothed in sackcloth and throwing ashes on their heads to show their remorse. Yes, Sidon, Tyre and Sidon will receive less punishment on the judgment day than you. And you people of Capernaum, what can I say about you? Will you be exalted to heaven? No, you shall be brought down to hell. Then he said to the disciples, Those who welcome you are welcoming me, and those who reject you are rejecting me, and those who reject me are rejecting God who sent me. When the seventy disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Even the demons obey us when we use your name. So, to our readings and a reflection on them. Well, firstly, in Ezekiel's time, there were many false prophets who said that God would rescue Judah and Jerusalem. And these hopeful lies made it hard to believe that the day of great judgment would actually come. But it did. And Ezekiel tried to prepare them for this. With poetic power and repetition, Ezekiel assured them that none would escape the coming calamity. Both the buyer and the seller would have reasons to mourn, for the wrath of God was on the land. Most of the time in scripture, when God announces a judgment, it's implied that there's an invitation to repentance, whereupon God will relent from the announced judgment. But with this prophecy, the prophecy of Ezekiel, that doesn't seem to be the case. The judgment was coming and that there would be no turning back. Prepare chains for my people, for the land is full of bloody crimes. Again, Ezekiel here is called to act out the prophecy by showing these chains. And these are likely the chains that would have restrained a violent, a violent criminal, those guilty of crimes of blood. God would allow great judgment to be the punishment and the restraint um, to, to this violent and wicked people. And in verse 24, we read, Therefore I will bring the worst of the nations. God made no claim that the invaders would be good and righteous, but they would be instruments of his severe correction against his people. They were not good. They were the worst of nations. There would be no quick and easy peace treaty, no tribute to pay to prevent disaster. It would surely come. Frightened by disaster and confused by rumour, some would finally seek God's word in the day of judgment, but there would be none. There was a terrible promise given by Ezekiel. Israel had sinned greatly 
and so great was the judgment that was coming upon them. Verse 27 ends though, then they shall know that I am Lord. So whilst Ezekiel said that judgment was coming and that there was no chance of it being turned back, he also makes the point strongly that God's purpose was not Israel's pain, but ultimately their restoration into a right relationship with him. In our gospel reading in verse 10 to 11, we read, but if a town refuses you, go out into the streets and say, we wipe the dust from your town, from our feet as a public announcement of your doom. Never forget how close you were to the kingdom of God. Jesus told his people to publicly say this in the streets and in the cities that rejected the 70s message and their messengers. It was important that those cities knew the price of rejecting Jesus and his kingdom. And in verse 16, Jesus said to his disciples, those who welcome you, welcome me. And those who reject you, reject me. And those who reject me are rejecting the God who sent me. As he sent that 70 disciples, he sent them out with the anticipation that some of them would be rejected. But Jesus also encouraged them with the thought that they were his representatives and should not take their rejection and their acceptance too personally. If others rejected their message, they rejected Jesus and also rejected his father who sent him. So what are we to make of these readings tonight? They're hard to read. There's judgment and there's punishment. And even the gospel message speaks of punishment for those who reject Jesus. Where's the love? Where's the grace? How do you view God? Do you view God as an old man sitting in the cloud? Is he for you an indulgent grandfather who just wants to see his children happy and will give in to whatever their whim is? Is he a wise guru dispensing um, wise words and ways to live your life? Is he a genie of the magic lamp? Just rub the side and your wishes will be granted. Or do you see him as a strict school teacher or parental figure just waiting for you to step out uh, aside of, of, of the correct way of doing things to punish you? Is he the hard taskmaster or the tyrannical boss who never lets up? Nothing is ever good enough. I was taught from an early age that if I wanted to know what God the Father was like, to look at God the Son, Jesus. And Jesus shows us the way that God loves and relates to us. And yes, in some ways, God does discipline us. He is strict, but he is also loving. He is both God Almighty and also the one who calls us his children. In 1 John 5, 3, John writes, this is the love of God to keep his commands. And in John 15, 10, Jesus says, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Now, there's a danger of thinking that these verses mean that God's love is somehow conditional on us getting it right. But God's grace isn't like that. Instead, they're showing us about the nature of that loving relationship between us and Jesus. Just as it would be strange for us to say to someone, I love you, but never do anything that the other person wanted or take advice for them. The same is true in our relationship with Jesus. We need to find out what he wants us to do. So let's have our hearts open and our ears ready to hear. <coughs> And then, like the 70, may we go out and share God's love with all we meet through our actions and our words. Let us pray. Loving God, we come to you as people who know your love. For that, we give you thanks and praise. Heavenly Father, thank you that through the witness of your word and your faithful service of other Christians, we heard the good news of the gospel and to come to faith in Christ, who alone has the words of eternal life. But Lord, we know that there are many in our world who do not know you. And we bring before you those who are lost, <coughs> those who are 
those who feel alone, abandoned and hopeless. Some live in our neighbourhoods, in our towns, in our cities. Some are our families and friends. We pray that we may be able to reach out to them with the message that through your grace they might know a different life in which they may be restored and renewed, loved and fulfilled, and that they might turn to you and go then on to reach out to others. <coughs> Lord, use us in the place where you've put us so that others may hear the good news of your gospel and be saved by the goodness and your grace. Amen. And Tuesday evening's New Testament song. Dear friends, we should love each other because love comes from God. Everyone who loves has become God's child and knows God. <coughs> Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love for us. He sent his one and only son into the world so that we could have life through him. This is what real love is. It is not our love of God. It is God's love for us. He sent his son to die in our place to take away our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us that much, we also should love each other. Amen. <clears throat> so we come to our evening prayers. Let us pray. Loving creator of all, watch over us this night and keep us in the light of your presence. May our praise continually blend with the song of all creation until we come to those eternal joys which you promise in your love. Father God, we rest in you. Jesus the Son, we rest in you. Holy Spirit, we rest in you. Loving Father, for the things this, of this day that have brought us joy, we give you thanks. Healing, Lord, for the things of this day that have brought us sorrow, bring peace. Spirit of life, in the closing of this day, give us rest. O oh God, you create all things, drawing them, drawing them to yourself. You made time, space and matter from nothing. Yet through you, they are given life and meaning. May the, these words of our prayers tonight, brought forth from nothing, rise to you as a sufficient offering of praise and thanksgiving. Amen. So as we think of our East Midlands Synod, we pray tonight for the ministers, the elders and the members of the churches in Leicestershire. Where there is darkness, let them bring light to your glory and to your name. Amen. Lord of all, we pray tonight for all our world where people are ill-equipped with what they need to bring life. We pray for those who are poor, hungry and homeless, the disabled, the sick or the suffering, the oppressed, the weak, the persecuted. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those denied the basic human rights, a basic education, employment, freedom of speech and conscience, a proper reward for their labours. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those living in lands racked by war and violence, victims of brutality. And especially at this time, we continue to think of all those living in Palestine and Israel. We pray for refugees, for those who have no country to call their own. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord of all, we thank you for those who have the courage to stand up for such people, the courage to stand up against injustice and the faith to believe that something can be done about it. We give you thanks for organisations like Christian Aid who work hard 
despite the powerful opposition, frequent misunderstandings and all kinds of obstacles, to build a fairer world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give them strength to continue their work and give us strength that we will continue to support their cause, not just once a year during Christian Aid Week, but every day through the lives we live, the sacrifices we make and the faith we proclaim. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we continue to pray for all those facing the challenge of COVID-19, especially in the light of this new Indian variant, <coughs> for strength and resilience and protection for all those responding in the hospitals and throughout the care system, and for those administering the vaccinations. We give you thanks for the rollout of the vaccination programme throughout the UK, for the lowering of the number of cases and hospital admissions and deaths due to COVID. And we do give you thanks for the sense of things starting to open up again, meeting friends and families and receiving hugs. We pray for the national health system as it faces the renewed challenge of treating those on their ever increasing waiting lists, those who have had to wait for investigations, treatments, procedures and operations. We especially continue to pray for aid and relief for India, South Africa, Brazil in their fight against COVID-19. <coughs> and Lord, we pray for all those who are facing difficult decisions and those facing mental health worries. Bring them peace, we pray. We pray with Celia for her grandson, Alfie and the family, that he may continue to stay strong, ready for his next round of treatment. And we pray with Liz for her 12 year old great nephew, Ryan. We've had an update from Liz tonight. Ryan was rushed to hospital at 4 a.m. today. He is very poorly with neutrophenic sepsis. So let us pray. Let us pray for healing for Ryan and for peace for him and for his family and for skill and wisdom for the medical team that is treating him. We continue to pray for Prince, for Cheryl, for healing and wholeness and comfort and peace in the light of Cheryl's diagnosis. We pray for, with Tom Schumann, for his brother James, and Tom has told us this, this evening that his brother is going in for surgery tomorrow. <coughs> so Lord, we just pray that you will be with those surgeons and that whole medical team that will look after James, that nothing will go amiss, that you will keep him free from any infections and that he will be fast uh, on the road to recovery, accelerated, accelerated by the power of your Holy Spirit. And with Moina, we pray for her son, Aidan, living with Crohn's disease. <coughs> we give you thanks that after testing positive for COVID-19, he is improving. And Lord, we pray that for a full recovery for him. We pray with Judith, Catherine, her niece, as she seeks to come to terms with that breast cancer diagnosis and waits that plan of treatment. And we pray for the Reverend Amanda Lindley, for her continued recovery from her operation. We pray with Angadair and are thankful with her that she is on the road to recovery. <coughs> we pray with Roger for Pauline and we continue to pray for guidance for Louise as she continues to reflect on that important meeting. And Lord, we pray for the Reverend Michael and June Pevy, for the, for the Reverend Graham Maskery and Vera, and for the Reverend Eric and Joan Allen. And in a moment of silence, Lord, we just lift up to you those known to us in need of prayer tonight. <coughs> Lord, we just pray for healing and wholeness, for strength and for wisdom, for guidance and comfort in each of these situations according to your will. And Lord, we pray for comfort and peace for all those who are grieving. 
<coughs> especially at this time, we think of the family and friends of the Reverend Malcolm Deacon. We ask for you to be close to his wife, Steph, son, Julian, and daughter, Tessa, and their families. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. <coughs> Now, <coughs> forever and ever. Amen. So may the Lord bless us and may he fill us with his grace and his peace. Amen. Good night. <laughs>